Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I think I got the desktop audio turned on. Um, forgot my water, but there's another water right here. Cool. All right. So I think we are good to go. I'm going to open up a demo board. Okay, um, so we're pretty much going to wrap up our 3.3 three today. Uh, Are you going to do share screen? Is that what you did? Yeah, I'm working on it. All right. So we're pretty much going to be wrap wrapping up the 3.3 three today. I, th uh, I was thinking about, like, what are some bonus information? Because I think the other three classes talked a lot about how the 3.3 three three works, why it works, what the results are and at least gave you a basic understanding if not like not a high level understanding but just a basic understanding um to start with uh so i figured some bonus information that we could talk about is the 3-3 three, three to the 3-4 and i figured this would be something that we could potentially talk about um all right so can everyone see what i'm doing i can see it all right so when your opponent does this um this is not really the common move, so this is a very rare move, but it can be played. Um, it can also be played against the Chinese opening and everything else. So it is a move that can be played, it's just not going to be very common, but it'll give us some bonus information about the 3-3. Three, three. Um, so first off, the normal response is the Hane. If we just Nobi, because touch, you either Nobi or Hane. If we just Nobi, it leads to the 3-3, three, three, and I'm pretty sure we all know that by now. Um, so usually it's a Hane. Uh, the most complicated response for white is here, um, but this one is not the most common one. Uh, but we can look at this one first. So usually to the cross cut you would nobi, and then white can play here, to Atari, and then go up. And now we have uh, variations. The simplest is for black to go here to kill the cutting stone, and we can play this way, um, like that, or maybe like that. And you see white gets some thickness, black gets a corner, uh, not super great for white uh, locally but again this was an invasion so black is supposed to be a little bit better and then there was a peep but the point is we have shape in our opponent's area and usually you play this like when your opponent controls that side so if we can get shape in the area it's not a terrible result so it's just a variation to keep in mind but usually the response is either going to be a or b so usually Dohane, you need to consider the reverse Hane. And this is actually a common shape in middle game as well. Um, so when you're in the middle game and you have you do a touch and then a Hane, uh, you don't just consider the cross cut. Uh, this is more at single digit Q than anything else. Uh, but you don't just consider the cross cut. You also consider the reverse Hane. Um, we won't go into a lot of detail about that. But this is a lot of shapes in the middle game can be found in Joseki's. And this is like one of those shapes. Uh, so in this case, let's just look at um, the reverse Hane. So the very first thing we want to think about is what if our opponent cuts us off? Okay, boop, boop, boop. Right? right. But we sacrifice one stone, threaten a life in the corner, and then we can live. So this is not that bad for white at all. So this is already like pretty good. Uh, so the first thing is, can I punish? Right? That's the first thing can we do. Can we punish the cutting point? If not, the second thing we look at is, can I just connect? Okay, if I connect and white keeps going, then I can punish the cutting point. So usually to the connection, we connect as well. Um, now we have this, 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 and look at that. Aha! <laughs> Who's seen this shape before? Anybody who was in the first video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so let's just, uh, if we chew the Hana, if we just reduce the ice space, we make life. If we reduce the ice space here, we go here and then here and then here. So it's alive. Um, so the only response for black is, uh, to consider is here and here. So the vital points, cause if you try to reduce the outside, you just make life. Uh, so the first vital point is here and this is just a refresher. So you can go here, here, here. Um, and then you can go here, 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 here 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 okay and then if you go here you double atari here 
Um, you can't connect because that's a Subatari. So you take, boom. So potentially, there is a Ko because of this move. You guys remember that? Yes. All right. And mm. is a Ko good here or bad here? It's bad at this time with no threats on the board, right? Yeah. Um, actually, that Ko there is actually considered good. And let's talk about why. <clears throat> okay. Um, would you go here on this empty board? No. No. Right? So, obviously, you would go here. So, what that means is, just from the start, this move is bad. However, can you potentially theorize that sometimes this would be good? Well, you, like you were telling your wife, that's, that, that could be good, absolutely. Um, well, if this uh, goes in, in the pattern that was there and you make the co, then I guess you get to take two corners, right? Well... It's more about you wouldn't play this until a specific timing. So you can consider this a timing Joseki rather than an opening Joseki. So you would right. never you would never play this in a Fuseki. But in the middle game, this can be an invasion point. So when you think about this move, you don't think about is this a good Joseki or a bad Joseki. That's completely wrong because obviously it's going to be bad. But if you think about it, is this a good invasion or a bad invasion? Will a ko can sometimes be a good invasion. So it has to do with, did you play this at the right timing or not? Okay, so if we just play okay. this, this can lead to a co, and that can be a very good timing for you. All right, so let's look at some other variations. Um, we have this one. And this one, white can escape. Depending on the board position, this can be a good sequence. Uh, this one would probably not be good, simply because it goes very strange very quickly. <laughs> like, what do you do with that? Um, but then we also have this one. Uh, this can be like this, and then push, and then push, and then, yeah, block. Do do alive. So you just live, but black gets thickness. So... That would be good for black, right? Well, actually, um, when you think about all this, you have to think... Okay, these are the possible variations, but when you're thinking good or bad with this type of move, everything everything should be bad locally, but as soon as you take into account a timing attack, you can start thinking about, okay, these are the possible variations. Are they good on this board? Or are they good on that board? Or are they good on this game? Or are they good in that game? Like, depending on what happens. And this is why this is, like, a uh, very high level, um, is because... This is not a good move by default, but if you have it at a good timing, it can be a very good move. Make sense? Yep. So, so would it usually be uh, a Tanuki situation that it would be good? Um, th it's more about when you invade in the middle game. Like this is a situational move, so I don't really have a good example of when you should do it, but. It's more about if the board position calls for it. So, like, for example, if your opponent had the large framework in the top right and you're looking for an invasion point, and for some reason this point and this point just don't look good, then you can get to this point. And okay. that could be good. Um, one second. Okay, uh, so it's more about when this specific stone or this specific invasion looks better than the other normal invasions when the top right is relevant if it's not relevant obviously just don't do it and if the other normal moves work then just use those but in some rare cases like again this is this is a, a an edge case this is not a normal move this is just extra knowledge in uh, some cases um this move might be better so it's another thing that you can think about make sense Yes. I have, a, I have another slight question, but if it's off topic, we'll just skip it. But uh, uh, there's some particular players that will play the three-three point as an opening move, mm -hmm. and so uh, could you, you? I think you'd have to basically get a tanuki or a sente move. So you have to go and here and they ignore. Play. Yeah. Uh, then, this is would this would be extraordinarily rare for them to do that. You, it would be probably something you would never consider. 
Um, I don't. It would have to be something super big to ignore this attachment to the three three. So, I the only situation I can think of is attach right here. But even this is a completely unique situation now. It's nothing. This it's not even close to the same thing, because now there's an extra extra stone, and one stone different can change the whole situation. Um, so now instead of like going here, uh, or actually, I wouldn't just do that. Like it would be completely different. So this and then ignore would probably never happen. And if it does, it would be a very very rare case scenario. Um, usually to the 3-3, three, three, we would go here, or here, or here. We almost never go here. And if we do, our opponent would almost never ignore. So this is probably maybe one in a million games. So not, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Be a like, possible likelihood, right? But yeah, but then we're not doing a 3-3 three, three invasion, now we're doing a 3-3 three, three Joseki. <laughs> so yeah, now we're getting into something that's off topic. But I just want you to understand that probably the reverse order would not happen. So okay. that's why invading to the 3-4 is potentially possible, but attaching to a 3-3 three, three and then getting ignored is very, very unlikely. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions about any of that so far? No. No. All right. So now, um, I kind of told you about that, but now let's get into something that's probably hard to do, which is how do we study Joseki with the AI? So how would we study this with the AI? So let's say it came up in your game. Now, this is just an arbitrary example that I have, but usually you'd play your own game and figure out if this was good timing or not, because if you look right here, obviously it's not a good move. Um, but let's say, uh, yeah, it's negative 9.7%. But let's say this was a good move in the game. So how do you study with the AI, like what the follow-ups are? So let's, let's try to do that together and let's just figure out what we can learn from it. Um, so I actually haven't looked with the AI yet, so let's just see what happens. So Hane obviously is going to be the move, because I told you that just goes to the 3-3. Three, three. So you want to punish a little bit. Um, so we got Hane, we're going to click Analyze This. Oh, I might have to refresh. I probably I probably waited too long. I had it up for a while, probably waited too long. Okay, boop, 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 boop. Okay, Analyze This. Um, so, yep, Hane is pretty much the only move. And it actually says the crosscut. Oh, see, I had no idea that that was what I expected. Okay, let's. So now I'm like, oh, cool. Something I didn't know. And this is where you would update from old Joseki to new Joseki. Like, okay, why is the crosscut played? So let's figure it out. Let's play here. Let's see what the options are. First, I, I know what my options would be. One of the nobies, right? Um, it looks like both nobies are. The AI agrees both nobies. So let's just play that out. And then I know there's an Atari and an Atari. Okay. Uh, which actually, I think, I think it didn't show that one. I think it showed this one, but it didn't show this one. Okay, so this one would be Nobi. Walk back. Here. Here. Have it, has anyone seen this shit before? <clears throat> uh, uh, let me set it up a little bit different and see if you recognize it. Do you recognize that sequence? It looks it's, it's like, familiar, but I don't. I think I always mess it up when like I see the, it. The, the, the dead shape. Yeah. So th this move is a probe, which probably you don't need until like five Q plus. Um, but the idea is this is one of the responses, and White lives in the corner. Okay. Um, now here's something that you may not know. Uh, <laughs> the follow up is actually here, not here. The reason is if you go here, White makes life. That's and then okay. you can look at the points. One, two, three points of territory. Okay, but if we go here, Y has to make life this way, and right. then here, 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 here. That's two points of territory. Right. So it's one point better. And if you go this way, then um, some weird stuff happens <laughs> because that for some reason that extra liberty just changes the result completely. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Um, and then, uh, let's see if I remember this one is here. Yep. And see, it's just not straight alive anymore. 
it's weird how expanding your eye space actually kills you instead of just living. Um, so this is a unique life and death problem, which is pretty cool. Uh, so this move is actually pretty cool because it takes this into account the unique shape in this corner to reduce it down by one point. And funny enough, I actually learned this from a professional who didn't learn this until she was a pro. She actually wow. she played this way every single time. And she was a pro professional player. And then another pro told her, hey, um, if you go this way, then it's one more point. And pro games are like decided by like two points, right? So one point extra is a lot of value. It's probably like, uh, I think for single digit cues, it'd be the equivalent of this is a 10 point difference. That's how big one point is to a pro. Like 10 points to 15 points at single digit queue. That is, that is the weight of one point at pro level. So this was a huge difference. And she said she, when her friend showed her this, she like was like, holy crap, how did I not know that? <laughs> That's the, how did I go so long without knowing this? So she showed me and oh, told me that story. What was the follow-up to that? that? That's it? Hmm? Yeah, here, 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 yeah. here. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Yep. So yeah, one move difference can make one point. So uh, that's that. So anyway, that's uh, that's how this shape is similar. You Atari under and just make life. And this is just the life. Uh, and so you'd go here, 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 here. Mm. So yeah, white can live. Um, so yeah, I just want you guys to know that one as well. I forgot to show that one. Okay, so back to this. So we're looking at this and it says Nobi. So Nobi is not one of the moves I would consider. So, okay. So when you're studying with AI, I would learn, I would look at the normal variations first. So I would like play it out on a real board and be like, okay, what would I do? And then if the AI doesn't even have that as an option, try to figure out why. What is the difference between this move versus this move? So let's, uh, we can actually, can we just highlight the move? Um, ah, right seems, here, it's seems like, Q15. Like okay, one. Be the right move, right? Um, R15 or S16 is what I would expect. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then black ignore. So it looks like white is just caring about the open side much more than the corner. And that's what it is. Um, the next is one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so white is going for influence here. Now, unfortunately, this is a bit above my pay grade, so which means I have no idea how to explain this to you guys, why this is bigger than the corner. But this is what the AI is making a claim at. Now, can you apply this? Probably not. Um, so maybe you could just rule this as something above your level until someone stronger explains it. But probably you would need, like maybe in song level to understand the difference because as far as i know i would atari under or atari right here all right so it says atari right here so that one's one of the ones i know so probably i would go for this one for now um and just figure out how the normal one works and it looks like it likes this one so it looks like it likes going for thickness no matter what um but i believe the end result is going to be about the same uh which is white gets thickness black gets a big corner oh it's still going wow so this is one thing that you could do is just like try to figure out what what does the AI want. So the AI clearly values the thickness and influence to the center more than the territory in the corner. So probably with that conclusion, you can conclude that on an empty side position, this move is probably not the right answer. Um, so yeah, look at that negative 10.9%. Um, so you can say black square is plus two. Uh, and right here, black square is one and a half. So <laughs> maybe about one point, less than one point, uh, but it's at 12%. So it's like, uh, it's a lot for the AI. So even though you go here and make life, even here, it still wants you to extend. What's the point difference between those two moves? Between, uh, on, um, uh, about one point. So between this move right here and this move right here, oh, it looks... No, not, not that one. Between uh, this uh, one? Q Q15 and... and... R15. Uh, Q15 and R15 uh, looks about half a point. You can see the 0 0.7 and the 1.2. Um, so negative 0 0.7 for white versus negative 1.2 for white. Uh, so it looks about half a point difference. So yeah. Um, uh, sorry, yep. if, I, if I can ask a question mm -hmm. on this tool, because um, yeah. the second line in any of those circles, so where it says like 39K or 1.5K, 
what is that number ch- telling that's, us? That's uh, that's the amount of times it checked it. So this is uh, playouts. So you see forty one k, forty one thousand playouts. Anything less than five hundred is probably going to be too weak. You want at least five hundred playouts um, for it to be considered like top level thinking. Um, now, if it has uh, this is 43 plus 300 plus 1600 plus 46 plus 12 plus 3. So if it's at three playouts, probably like 016 is like barely even considered. Like it would be an extraordinarily, um, excuse me, an extraordinarily rare case scenario. Um, so this actually, um, funny enough, um, this is actually potentially what it would look like for the uh, mistake that AlphaGo made against Lee Sedol, where AlphaGo glitched or whatever, it picked one of these moves down here for some reason. Like, it was not one of the top moves. It was like a one in, I forget, maybe it was a one in two million chance or something like that, that it wouldn't pick up there and it still did, and it did it and made a mistake and Lee Sedol jumped on it. Um, it. It's like something like that. But the playouts. Um, basically mean how many times did it visit this branch. So if it's 52,000, um, that's probably the one it really, really likes. Uh, so even at default, even just the starting moves, you can see it just starts with 129,000. That's because this position has been repeated so many times. It just saves it in the system. Uh, but let's play out a bunch of moves or whatever. Uh, when you're looking at it, you don't want to trust any of these moves until it gets to around 500 or pl- fi- above 500. Um, now, some of these moves would be good. So, like, two or three hundred is probably, like, Dawn level. But once you get to, like, 500, that's when you start getting into pro level. So, for example, if you're using the OGS tool, which I think a lot of people have when you click support OGS or any of the uh, stuff, um, you can see the Q supporter, Dawn supporter, pro supporter. You go down here and you can see the playouts. So, the supporter at 125 playouts is the amateur Dawn level. Uh, I think that's a little bit inaccurate. Uh, but 125 playouts is actually really, really weak. Um, compared to what it should be. Uh, 300 playouts is, uh, they say, professional level. Maybe it could be a professional player, but ideally you would want 500 playouts. Uh, you can see strong professional player. That's starting to be correct. Yeah, 800 or above 500 playouts is when it's starting to get really strong. And then that's where you get beyond most professional players. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, that does. Thank you. So any sort of subscription, anytime you do a subscription to be like OGS or AI Sensei or Zbeduk, um, you want the subscription that it does a minimum of 500 playouts because then you know at least it's pro level at minimum. Um, so yeah, uh, that's what you want to look at. So when you're looking at these uh, playouts, um, you want to make sure that they're not just like 14. <laughs> so probably that's not the one to consider. Uh, sometimes... Uh, your moves might be there, and it doesn't necessarily make it a bad move. It's just likely not the top moves the AI is considering. It's not going to be like nine on pro level. <laughs> um, so here, fifty four thousand, one point nine thousand. Those are probably the two moves to consider. The rest are kind of like what a, uh, a edge case scenario, like a maybe scenario. But these two are pretty much the only two to consider uh, according to the AI. And then this one's not even being considered. So the S sixteen, S sixteen. Yeah, it has one play out. <laughs> so you can see he's not even considering it um but it's not even considering it but it's still only like one point difference it's it's kind of funny uh however what we can learn from this just by looking at this it's probably too difficult to like memorize the exact moves but we can understand the idea of the ai wants the outside here not the inside so we can say okay now I understand that concept. So what is a simple variation that I can use and apply in my level that'll go for the outside instead of the inside? And probably just here. Yeah, it's negative 4.5%, but this is the one that maybe most of you know. Uh, Nobi is possible. Um, maybe you can play this one out and say, okay, can I apply this? Is this something I can actually remember? The follow-ups aren't too difficult. Um, and you can play it on, on your own board and see if you can try to counter yourself. How confusing does it get? Uh, so this is a way to study. It's really complex, so it's not like the most efficient or effective study. But if you want to study unique positions, this is an okay way to do it. Um, so he goes here, and I think most people would get like right here uh, first, and you could just do that. And then probably they would go right here. And then you could just Atari. Uh, looks like the AI wants to threaten the squeeze, actually, which is interesting. 
you can see the AI really likes the outside. So I would go for the base, but AI wants influence. Um, so you can actually get a lot of uh, interesting variations. And I know there's a lot of people that really, really love to do this, uh, which is go through all the AI Josekis. And I think there's a lot to learn there, but I also think it's very inefficient. I would care more about understanding what's going on rather than learning the exact moves because I have learned that a lot of these players that review with AIs and just go over variation after variation, their opening is probably a lot better than mine, but their middle game, their decision making is uh, a little bit lacking unless they have a lot of experience. So it, you got to be very careful that you don't spend too much time reviewing the AI because at the end of the day, you have to be able to make decisions without the AI during a live game. So you need to think, how does the AI arrive at this conclusion? And this is why studying with AI is so hard. It can't tell me why the outside is better. You just have to like assume that, okay, influence is better towards the open direction than it is for the points in the corner. But at what point does that points in the corner become larger than the influence? Don't know. The AI can't tell us. So we just have to go by case by case. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, with that being said, you can actually get really creative here and find some really cool sequences um, and maybe find some really unique Josekis. And this is where you can start updating your Joseki not library. Like, like um, I think a good example of this is when you're approaching here. I think uh, there can be a lot of interesting things to consider. Like, okay, is this one... So everyone knows this Joseki, but is this one actually good? What about this one? My opponents have been doing this one for some reason. Uh, is this good? It says negative 4.3, so it's white plus one. And this one is white plus half. So this is a half a point better. And if you want to really fine tune your game, you can think like that. But then you also have like, okay, if it's only a half point loss, but, this could, but my opponents are consistently messing this up, maybe I'll play this and I'll have this secret weapon. So you'll take a local loss to make the game harder for your opponent. Sometimes you can have some secret weapons like that. So you're like, I'm just going to play a Joseki that is not bad for me, but my opponents consistently mess it up. Okay. just And then as soon as they stop messing it up, you get strong enough they stop messing it up, then you just switch back. You can actually have some very interesting things. Um, with my Go Club members, we were going to a tournament once, and I told them to all learn one Joseki uh, that is unconventional, so they can have a secret weapon that will throw off their opponent's game, throw off their flow. And so if you're going to a tournament, um, it could be it could be pretty useful to have like one Joseki, maybe two, that are just like secret weapons where you know the variation. And if they know the variation too, you don't lose that much, maybe two points. But if they don't, then it throws off their rhythm, throws off their flow. They get really confused and they don't have a lot of experience with it. And potentially you can mess them up a lot uh, by doing that. Because how many times... Because I know this is a very common thing at uh, the lower levels. How many how many opponents like approach here and just completely mess you up? Or actually, how many opponents approach here at single digit Q and they do these crazy type moves to mess up your flow and it just throws you off so much that you just get confused and overwhelmed and you just lose the game? This happens a lot, right? I get messed up in the beginning of the middle game. That's where I mess up. Yeah. I've seen a lot of my students respond right here because like I want to surround. And I'm like, no fundamentals bases. Right. Um, but the, this type of idea, like, okay, I can go here. This is uh, black plus like half a point, And this is white plus half a point. So it's like a one point loss <clears throat> so far. Um, and then I can just ignore. Okay. I take a one point loss, but my opponent has no idea how to handle it. Sometimes that can happen. I think this one's a bad one, <laughs> bad example, but uh, something like this one can be pretty good. And I know there, were, uh, I have a story from like Go Congress. So this is a Joseki that was very, very popular back when I was Tudon. And like every Tudon freaking played this Joseki. It was like so common. It was every single time, I swear. And we all knew the Joseki pattern. Um, so you remember, this is like uh, maybe six years ago. This was played like every single time. Um, and we all knew the Joseki pattern. Uh, so funny enough, it was actually here. This this big giant red thing that the AI hates is what everyone played. Um, but funny enough, it was here. Uh, and then it came into went into a whole Joseki and everyone knew the variation. Well, uh, the Fung Yun Go School. Uh, Fung Yun is a Go instructor in New York. The Fung Yun Go School 
she, uh, Feng Yun is a professional, Chinese professional. She taught all of her students this move. This move was not very common. It's a trick move. And the result is only a little bad for black. Not very much. But if white messes it up, the result is very good for black. Like, really, really good for black. And so, in the middle of the tournament, we have uh, the Feng Yun Go School at Go Congress playing this Joseki that no one knows. And by the middle of the week, uh, like, I went to I went to a pro lecture, and someone in the single digit Q section asked about this move because their opponent did it. And I asked them, I was like, was your opponent someone from the Feng Yun Go School? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, yeah. Well, this is a thing that Feng Yun taught, and now everyone at Go Congress has to learn this stupid Joseki because the stupid school taught it to them, and none of us knew the response to it. So it, it, it's it's kind of this idea of you have a secret Joseki or secret weapon that if there's something that's really, really common that everyone's playing, and you cha and you tweak one thing to throw everyone off, um, you could potentially create an advantage for yourself in a lot of games. Um, so it, be it, it became into a complicated Joseki. Um, I don't quite remember it now uh, because I didn't play this one all that much. I only had to learn it for the Go Congress, and then I never played it again. <laughs> uh, but you can you can sometimes for a tournament come up with a secret weapon where you find a Joseki um, against something that's very common that everyone plays, and you tweak it by like one move and maybe take a local two point loss. But it throws off your opponent's flow a lot. And it can be a lot of fun to do that. Um, so that's an. Players just playing white often do that with. If they're playing a handicap game again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, trick moves and handicap games are great. Okay. Um, so, um, we got a little bit off topic there, but mostly I just want to make sure that you guys understand, like, understand the bonus information of 3-3s, three and then we kind of just can see like how to study new patterns and expand our knowledge of the 3-3. Three three. Um, even further using the AI. Uh, however, with that being said, I really want to stress that before you use the AI, you really need to understand all the fundamentals. Because we just spent the entire month learning all these simple patterns with the 3-3. And I say simple because compared to the AI stuff, it is simple. Like all of the stuff that you guys learned this week is like just the, just the starting point of the 3-3. And then you expand your knowledge with high dawn variations and pro variations and ai variations and you expand upon that but this is one thing i want to stress and i'll show you a good example of this is don't play the high level stuff without understanding the low level stuff so like this one everyone loves this one because the ai does it but almost all the people at the q level that play this one don't even understand how this one works and this one is a lot simpler but if I was to play like right here, they would have they would like fall apart. Or if I play right here, they have no idea what to do, and and they would never play this move because they don't know it. And this is a quite a common move. Um, like if you play like three four right here, and like this, this is a very common move to go right here. This is an opening pattern. See, because it makes a very nice combination. Yet. A lot of a lot of Q players don't even know this move, yet they're going to try to learn all of these moves because the AI doesn't. And this is one thing I want to stress when you study with the AI. You need to learn the low level stuff to understand the high level stuff. If you don't know, if you don't know the basics of the three three variation, how can you even begin to learn the three three attachment? Like, how, how can you even begin that? Because if I go here, it goes back to the 3-3, three, three, and you have no idea what to do. You might start doing something weird like this. And why, why would you do that? It just goes back into the simpler variation. So make sure that you're not going to the AI without really understanding the fundamentals and the basics, because the AI is doing, like, literally perfect play for, for human comparison, um, or human relativity, I should say. It's practically perfect play. How can you possibly comprehend perfect play if you don't even understand the fundamental play? So be very, very careful about using AI for the high-level stuff, and be very cautious about copying high-level play without fully understanding the simple stuff of fundamentals. 
if you don't even understand bases, how can you understand a high level invasion? Make sense? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so that pretty much concludes this month on the 3 3. So I think what could be fun is uh, does anyone have any questions about any patterns or ideas that I can potentially go over and talk about? And I think that uh, someone mentioned uh, in the comments earlier about next month's theme, maybe being Joseki. Uh, I think we could talk about like Joseki, like what Joseki's we should know and like how to handle Joseki's next month. Um, if you guys are good with that, maybe we can just talk about like how to pick Joseki's and stuff next month. Well, um, sounds good. Thing, yep. One thing I don't know, may, maybe it's again yep. something you don't want to get into right now, but. Uh, no, now is free I'm, questions, uh, just freedom of okay, questions right now. Okay, I'm interested in the situations where the uh, it looks like it's good for um, the person who gets the outside in the corner, uh, but in reality, it turns where AI says it's definitely not as good for reasons of um, that the something to do with that area was whites already, say. And so black by invading there and even living at all in, in, in a shape that looks totally good for, for white, it a, is actually in favor of uh, black. That's the kind of thing I'm kind of interested in. Okay, so a good example of that, I believe, would be a shape like this, where it's like, okay, black has this corner. And then somehow you get in and you're able to make like life or something. Uh, maybe you lose the co, and then white just lives. Boop, boop, boop. And white just lives in your corner. And you're like, okay, that's fine. I don't care that white lived. I got all this thickness, right? But actually, this is really bad for black. Because black had three moves here. Three moves in this corner. And yet white still was able to make life. So... Usually when you're talking about situations like that, usually the reason it's bad is because you spent so many moves in that area and you still lost it. So whenever you're thinking about like, um, how is this result good or bad? Or is this result even or whatever? Think about how many moves each player had in that area. So if, if you have three moves to one move and it's an even result, that's bad for you. But if you have two, three moves to one move and it's good for you, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad for the other color. It just means whatever it means, right? But you have to take into account the like uh, the amount of moves. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Trying to bit picture that in my mind. That's kind of what I'm trying to. Yeah. So if we have if we have one on one like this, this should be like an, a more or less an even result. Um, but let's say we ignore, and now it's two on one. This should be uh, easier for white to handle than black. And then let's say we ignore again and we get right here. Like, okay, this should definitely be good for white locally. <laughs> um, and then black lives. And now let's say we play, we ignore again and we go here. We ignore, and then later in the game, we come back and live with the stone. That would be very painful because we spent four moves there. Black Tanuki three times and we still live. That would be painful. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's one reason why you keep saying settle, make it easy and settle the area before you go on somewhere else. So that's what mm -hmm. you don't make. Yeah, so <laughs> um, does that kind of answer your main question, though? Yes, it does. Okay, uh, now let's talk about one thing that uh, uh, Kadar and I kind of keep uh, bumping heads about a lot, um, in a good way, uh, in a good way. Uh, I always tell my students to settle an area before moving on. Right, because it's almost always the correct answer most of the time, um, but there are cases where it's not. And uh, one thing that Kato likes to do is to nuke an area before it's finished for something of equal value. So a good example of that is you would to nuke a three three to invade another three three. Um, that is technically equal value, but it's very complex, and I usually don't recommend complex things for my students. Now let's talk about why. Okay. When you ignore one area for another, it, what it means is that area, you don't mind your opponent getting an advantage there compared to what they would have had if you had just responded. So you're giving value, 
okay? Well, you're making a statement that the other area is of equal or greater value, okay? That's what it yeah. means to ignore something, uh, to go somewhere else when it's not finished. But how can you say that that other area is equal or greater value when you don't know how to count yet? And that's that's one thing that uh, I always tell my students, like, why are you ignoring when you don't even understand what value is? Like, don't you don't even understand what control means, like controlling an area versus actual territory. You don't understand that. So how could you choose to ignore? Now, in Kadar's case, um, usually he just ignores for the exact same shape. So it's clearly the exact same value because it's the exact same shape, but it creates very complex situations of, okay, at what point does going back over here become more valuable instead of responding locally? Like, at what point do you have to go back? Like, that's really, really hard to judge. That's a really hard judgment. And so it's not that you can't do it. It's not that it's bad. It's just difficult to understand. And difficult to understand equals questionable follow-ups. So that's why I always tell you guys to finish areas first. However, if you watch pro games, and let's just look at uh, the European Pro League. I think that's a good uh, European Go Federation. I think this is a good example. I love the openings I've been seeing out of the European pros. Um, they just seem so high level compared to what they used to be. It's like such their openings are like so perfect compared to what they used to be. Um, however. Uh, with that being said, I, it's an opening style that I can never copy until without extensive study. Uh, let's do this one. Uh, maybe not that one. Where is their league? Well, there's, um, what is that one? Um, Where's the leagues? The ones that they have the leagues right. and there was played. an European Pro League. Should Trans we that Atlantic one? Pro League or something? That, that's one. Is that in there? Mm, I thought it was up here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think this is. Yeah. This is what I'm looking for right here. Um. So let's just we can just look at these openings. That's not exactly what I wanted, but <laughs> let's just look at these openings. Do I have KGS? I do. Okay, let's look at this. Um, I don't have it on stream, though, unfortunately. Okay, so I will switch to display capture on stream. Not that one. There we go. Okay, uh, so let's just look at this opening. Now, you can see that they're already applying the new stuff. And you see they ignore, they ignore, they ignore. You see how immediately this is not basic right immediately this is not basic so you're like why aren't they defending the weak group why did they make a second weak group on your opponent's side and then why did black ignore instead of attacking and punishing this is some high level crap right here well it has to do with the fact that this stone cannot be killed um so potentially you could actually go here because the profit from this is usually a lean like so and then uh white can live but black gets a lot of influence. So if you immediately cancel out the influence, you don't really mind the profit. So black has to, instead of uh, doing that, black might have to switch gears and go over here. Uh, now black goes for the profit up here. So you're like, okay, maybe I just go here. And also you have to understand how the variations in here work. So understand why this one maybe potentially threatens some, th something in here, right? You have to understand, it, it's just a high level combinations of understanding what is, the, what is the result or what is the punishment if I ignore what happens to the stone? Well, here or here, right? That's usually what happens to the stone. You also have here, but that's not as good. Um, and I know that. But imagine what, if I know that, imagine what the pros know about it. Okay, and then you have all of this stuff. And I haven't, I haven't got to study this one yet. But you have all of that stuff. So black, white is taking all those variations into account and all these variations into account to make a combination. And then black is saying, okay, that's what the combination is. But I also know that if I ignore, you can't really do much else, and I'm going to play something big, and then maybe try to get back up here and make the combination. So they're looking at three situations, which they know all the resp local responses, which you, I encourage you to learn the local responses first. They know all the local responses, and then they make this global 
kind of combination idea. And let's just see how this works. So white chooses Sente, and we talked about that. White chooses Sente because there's urgency, and then white goes and uh, messes up this position. But black should be okay with this because black is the one who ignored. So it's black is going for a simple response, simple response, and starts a fight. And now a fight starts, and both players are pretty much equal. You can see black has the corner, white has two weak groups, but black also has a little bit of a weak group. White's a little bit flexible over here, and white's out over here, so white has some influence to make up for the corner, but white also had influence over here. So there's a lot that's happening. And so these games are fascinating to watch because the combinations and the tanukis are so high level, but at the same time, if you don't even understand the local variations, how could you apply this? This is, this is something that I see a lot of where they're like, oh, well, a pro ignores, ignored um, and left, so I can ignore and leave. But how do you understand what is even, how do you understand that you can ignore that without knowing what the responses are locally? And how do you, and how can you say that white ignored when white played on the same side of the board and white's taking into account the variations here and the combinations with the stone? So does, does that, do you, do you guys kind of understand that idea of, yes, pros are cool, but they also are applying the fundamentals? They're just applying at a very high level. So when you're looking at, can I ignore? You have to understand what will happen. What is the value of that? And if you ignore, will you get just as much value? And then we get into unique stuff. <laughs> and the game is hard. Right? And we can actually look into the pro game. And I bet you it's going to be the exact same idea. Is that something that's only happening in the European leagues, or is that also like in other other regions? Um, the style of the thing. I think that it's happening in Korea too. Let me. Uh, I just noticed it more in the Korean because it's easier to understand. I think it's happening in Asia too. So let me just. Uh, browse by date. We can just look at the most recent games. So I think Korea would be more. Uh, relevant. So that's Chinese, China, Korean, Women's League. We want to look at like the LG Cup or something, the international stuff. Um, Hanguk Kiwon Championship. Uh, okay, so that's the Korean League Championship between 9P. So that's probably like fighting for like their rankings and stuff. So we just see what this looks like. And it should look something similar, but maybe done a little bit better. Uh, I'll just download this to make it bigger for you guys. That's a bit of a side note. Uh, Trey Jing is one of the strongest female players right now. Uh, who'd you say? Uh, white in this game, Trey Jung. Okay, just Trey Jung. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, I need to read their Hangul names to be able to pronounce it properly. I can't read it in yeah, English. I... <laughs> Reading it in English messes me up so much. I need to see the the Hangul. To be able to pronounce it. Um, okay, so this is just the Korean League. Um, isn't a what is rank, what rank is what is the placement of Choyeon? I <laughs> just look at this. I, yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I, I would assume in the top 200, maybe top. top two, no, she should be in like the top 20. Choyeon. No, uh, is she? No, like I mean, female. She's like top one or two, but. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, among, yeah, yeah. The, among the pro, all the pros, then yeah, top two hundred. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, among the, among Korea, I think top twenty, possibly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is already like, <laughs> what what is going on? Just ignoring corners. Yeah, this is what I mean. Like they're doing it as well. It's just even more high level and even harder to understand. <laughs> <laughs> like who does this <laughs> like, do not copy this move this is why i'm like be careful about copying pros do not copy this crap <laughs> all right uh let's see someone actually asked a question on youtube i try to study big avalanche just like he's with ai uh is it good at 8k to do this kind of thing uh i wouldn't do but this but just for understanding um I would use Joseki dictionaries for Avalanche and just learn the main branches. I would not study the Avalanche uh, with the AI at 8Q. Um, unless it's some simple variations that you can follow. Um, you got to be very careful because something like Avalanche and Taisha, there, there's literally like so many ways to go. Like probably the Taisha is like a thousand Joseki's, right? 
a th- it's a, the Joseki of a thousand variations. So Avalanche is pretty up, has hundreds of variations. So you got to be very careful about overwhelming yourself, especially at 8Q. Just learn the main branches so you can have an understanding of a simple response. I wouldn't go too deep into it. There's other stuff that's more e- uh, that's more important for you to learn at that level. Yeah. Um, hey, look. What that? Everyone remember this shape? This reverse honey? We just talked about that, right? Mm-hmm. And in, if you know Joseki, then you can see variations like this. So this looks super good for black. But if you look at the whole board, influence, influence, and then a 3-4, and the center looks like it's in white's control. So you got to be fair. It's very interesting. And then, of course, what do you see? A consistent center plan. You don't see white going for territory. You see white has center. White goes for center. Consistent play. Um, so, yeah, I would say it's it's pretty much the same thing as the European League. It's just, for me, it's easier to follow the European League than the pros. Because this is just complex. <laughs> this is just crazy. Um, it's so hard to follow the games um, in modern times. Like, I can't even comprehend a lot of these moves. Like, some of the moves I can. Some of the moves make sense. But just look at the, looking at the opening. It's like, I'm going to invade immediately instead of taking the th- uh, open corner. And it's like, okay, you make a Shamari, I'm going to attach to your face. <laughs> because you didn't play two space, you played one space. I'm going to punish. I'm going to attach to your face. How does that even work, right? So, yeah, the Koreans do it too. The a- Asians do it too. It's just at a more confusing extent, at a higher extent. Um, so I would say if you wanted to study pro games, uh, I would review... Oh, crap. That's not what I wanted to do. Uh, da, da, da. Let's get my screen back. If you wanted to study pro games, I would do like go like something like Go for Go. I really like Go for Go uh, because I can use it on an app on my phone as well. Uh, I would do something like Go for Go and then go browse by date or GoKifa.com is pretty good. And I just click old games before 1970. And most of them should be in Japan. Uh, Japan is really, really good. So let's see. Let's go to go. Kifu.com. And I just want to show you guys the difference in play. Um, let's do Shuzaku. I love Shuzaku. Alright, so this is like 1850, right? Let's look at this game. And let's just look at the difference. Alright. So... Uh, this is, uh, this was normal for these times, and you have to understand that that's because white doesn't have Komi. So, w- normally it'd be like this, and then white would immediately approach, because they considered black getting a Shamari to be too valuable, because white didn't have Komi, so they said that white has to play faster. Once white had Komi, the play actually started to settle down. So this is before white had Komi. So even though it looks crazy, this, this makes sense with that context. And three fours and these, which threatened Shamaris, Shamaris were super valued back then. But now let's look at the middle game. And so you see Shamari, Shamari, stopping Shamari, stopping Shamari. It's just all about the Shamari so far. All right, now we just go into basic shapes. Um, this goes. This is a little confusing, maybe. So maybe this isn't the best example. But they're making base, making base. It's connected. And the shapes actually start making a lot more sense. And this is actually starting to look a lot like the Glossy approach, if you guys recall. Like you slide for your base, make your base, attack with a knight's move. Poke, extend from the Shamari, extend from the Shamari, play it on the open side, maybe go attack this soon. Okay, so we're going to poke in here. I'm going to stay connected. This is a squeeze play. Squeeze, stay connected, take the eyes. So this actually makes a lot more sense to me, and I could follow this a lot better. Um, I'm not sure how this look to, looks to you guys. Does this look any different than the Korean ones and European ones? It looks yeah. like a civilized game. 
<laughs> it, it looks like it's using fundamentals at a good level <laughs> right <laughs> this is like oh so this is what fundamentals look like but then you have like modern play it's like where are the fundamentals do they even ha- know them at that at, in the modern play like i don't think they know fundamentals in modern play right it just looks like that right but actually it's they're taking the fundamentals and they build on it and they build on it and they build on it and build on it and build on it and build on it and, it, and then they have ai which builds on top of it even more so it's just like layers on a cake if you look at modern play and you only see or maybe like uh layers of a mountain or something if you only see like the top of the mountain you're like that's crazy this doesn't make any sense how is this rock floating ten thousand feet in the air but then if you look at the base and you see the foundation the fundamentals that it's built off of then it's like makes perfect sense how there's rocks ten thousand feet in the air you're like did did men just keep stacking rocks for 10,000 feet. No, it's just the weather happened and it got pushed up and however mountains form, right? Uh, it, but it's built off of foundation and fundamentals. So this, if you're going to review pro games, I would recommend like the 1800s and 1900s Japanese pro games. There's a lot that you can apply. And I cannot tell you how effective it is to beat Q players using this st- old stuff because the amount of people, the amount of people uh, that I've seen my students face that copy modern play without understanding these fundamentals and just get destroyed as soon as a fight happens because their shape doesn't work together. Because their stuff is cuttable. They don't understand timing. They don't understand the fundamentals. And all of this fancy stuff just crumbles under the slightest bit of pressure. But then if you have the fundamental shapes like this, it's a lot harder for you to crumble. Now, granted, it's not as effective as modern play, because I think modern the uh, modern AI stuff would beat this stuff pretty handily. But at the lower levels, this is a lot easier to use. This is a lot easier follow-ups. So that's why I always encourage you guys to learn the fundamentals first. And if you want to review pro games, I would review the older pro games and work your way through the histories so that we can slowly but surely understand modern play, uh, because you understand how Shamari's went from shamari and extension to a high shamari for influence to the ai shamari now and then you just work your way up through that that's all why i tell you to learn this first if you don't even understand this one you can't play this one it just doesn't make sense does that does that kind of make sense for you guys yes um okay so i kind of talked about to, to reiterate everything we talked about this last one i kind of wrapped up the three three a little bit showed you a few more uh three three shapes to keep an eye out for to basically just it's not something you're going to be able to apply a lot but if it comes up at least you should have an idea um and then of course if it comes up you forget you can always revisit the lecture so we wrapped up the three three and showed you a couple more variations we talked a little bit about the ai and how you could potentially use that to study but you have to be very careful and then of course we talked about the differences in styles in pro games and how copying pros can be very dangerous if you're not careful and understanding why certain styles and moves are played and then we looked at comparing old play to modern play and just seeing like the history of go uh, so that's kind of like what we talked about today. We got a little bit, um, we went in a, in a very interesting direction, but mostly I just wanted to wrap up 3-3 and then answer any questions you guys have. So with that, do you guys have any final questions or comments about the 3-3 or anything that we talked about today? No. All right. So are you guys all 3-3 masters now? <laughs> yeah, we'll never oh, make another 3-3 three, three mistake. <laughs> okay, so... Oh, by the way, mm-hmm. I gotta say, uh, I re- I'm really enjoying going through the Little Pig uh, set. Mm-hmm. I've been through it twice now, and it sure does reinforce that co move. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the set is really, really good. Um, I did both the Little Pig, like uh, I tried to uh, when I was doing 100 problems a day, um, like last year. I was doing like, trying to do like 100 problems a day. Uh, I spent like three days just doing the little pig and the big pig and I would do the whole set both sets the next day I did both sets and the third day I did both sets and for the next three months I didn't mess up a single move with that with the pig shapes so probably I need to do it again it's something that probably is useful to do like every year just to like pick it up again just to make sure because it's a common variation but um, I know uh ill luck is watching this as well so i'll give i'll give you a piece of advice if you want to get like really strong at the reading um 
actually, no, I want the spreadsheet. Where's my spreadsheet? Ah, uh, waitchy. <laughs> Where's my spreadsheet? I swear I have it in my in my recent. Uh, well, you, you have it in my um, in my link with you, and my you know because you gave it to me. In yeah, there, so you can't find it anywhere else. There you go. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so I would say if you want to be really uh, a really strong Dawn player, I would do every single one of these problems every year. And just get faster and faster and faster at it. I would say one to... No. No. Yeah, the entire spreadsheet. If you wanted to be a really strong Dawn player, like really good at reading, um, I would repeat every single one of these problems every year. And then, of course, you're, I would say, play like five to ten games a day. <laughs> if you want to be really, really good. <laughs> um, yeah, like, like, life and death is definitely my, my biggest issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's my issue too, trust me. I think if I wanted to get 8 Dawn, uh, so if you guys want to know what I would do, if I really, really wanted to get to 7 Dawn right now, which I don't because I know what is required and I don't have that kind of time. If I really wanted to, though, I would, I would try to play about 10 games a day with a review most of them if not at least several of them to work on like whatever i'm working on for the week review with the ai a little bit to give myself some general uh opening practice um i would read my ai joseki book to make sure i understand and study the ai josekis i would practice them i would just pick one play it play it for the next 50 games like that two space uh thing or whatever uh with a three four and the two space high i would play that for like 50 to 100 games and I would review it with the AI until I knew all the variations inside and out. So I would study my opening, study Joseki's, um, and I would do probably like one to 200 of these problems every single day. And that would pretty much be my daily training. I would play games for experience, review them, and review with the AI, mm -hmm. learn my opening and Joseki's and middle game dilemmas, um, but mostly play, and then do these like one to 200 a day. If I, if I really wanted to, to get to seven on and then I would do that for an entire year uh yeah so that's that's a that's a lot of hard work and I don't want to <laughs> I can't blame you because <laughs> um because unlike unlike the single digit key ranks that would be maybe one rank in a year <laughs> maybe two ranks if I'm lucky in a year doing that consistently every single day and that's just for two ranks so it's really annoying to be a Don player sometimes um I want to go back to like I guess you, I yeah. guess you have to decide when enough is enough you know <laughs> um it's more like what why would I want to be a seven uh I'm not gonna make any money for it I'm still not going to be an American pro. There's no benefit to me being an American pro. Like, I think I would get more students if I had pro status, but like, I can't beat the current American pros, uh, the other amateurs to be an American pro. There's the American pro system is really bad right now. So there's really no good reason for me to do it other than bragging rights. And I'm like, I would rather just build my teaching career. <laughs> it's, it's a lot more uh, profitable. Um, what would you consider your your down level to be exactly? Um, I'm four don AGA, five don Fox, uh, three don OGS. So I would cons those? I would consider myself a mid don. Okay. Um, I can pretty consistently beat one don and two don, so I would consider myself a mid don, but I would not consider myself even close to a high don. Okay. But yeah, that would be what I do. So if you guys want Dawn level reading, uh, I've said this to my students so many times, but I don't think anyone's done it yet. <laughs> but if you want Dawn level reading, do every set three times and just work. start from the top, work your way down and do every single problem three times in a year. If you can, if you can consistently do that, you'll have Dawn level reading. Um, I'll link this. Oh, I got my work cut out for me. <laughs> yeah, you and every other student I have. Because I don't think anyone's done it yet. Where's my copy? Well, some of this stuff I end up taking an hour on just one problem. Sometimes. No, don't take an hour. Um, if you can't see it in 30 seconds, just look at the answer. For the, for this stuff? No, I'm, I'm talking about going through all the variations after you uh, know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for the stuff on this, on this page, um, this is all about pattern recognition. This is not about deep reading. 
deep reading is like ladders and stuff like if you to visualize and everything else the all of this page is about being able to recognize these shapes and patterns instantaneously now i do encourage you to, to do ladder problems every day i think it, i really wish they had a ladder problem go book i would buy that um and then i i would say solve one ladder problem every day and just visualize it just visualize just practice stone visualization every single day um and then but i on this page it's more efficient and the the purpose is to just learn the patterns so if you, you should be able to solve all of these problems within 30 seconds to have dawn level reading 60 seconds at the very most but if you can't then not quite down level reading yet uh just look at the answer learn the pattern come back to it do it again and do it do it again do it again do it again do it again eventually you'll be able to solve it within 30 seconds why is that important is because you can solve every single one of these problems and recognize the shapes within a bio yomi period so that means even in bio yomi you will have very powerful shapes and you can punish bad shapes very quickly and very easily um and this is all the fundamental shapes for life and death and reading. Like, it's all the fundamental shapes. Cutting points, connection to Suji's, cut to Suji's, Seki's, life and death. Like, all of this is the fundamental middle game shapes. So just being able to recognize all of that is good. Now, unfortunately, you will not be a Dawn player just from this. Because uh, if it was just reading, everyone would be Dawn. Um but you will have dawn level reading and shapes if you can solve all of these and then from there you just have to work on your fundamentals and of course practice 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 um and i'll leave you guys with this final note the biggest mistake that i see my students making is not playing enough games i cannot tell you how important it is to gain experience okay if you really want the secret to becoming a Dawn player, the fastest you can do, play more games. Ideally, if you look at Asians and stuff, they're probably playing like 10 games. They're, probably, they're spending like 8 to 10 hours a day and playing like 4 games a day. And then reviewing really in depth. Okay, for Westerners, I've said the Westerners that I've seen go from like 2 Dawn, 3 Dawn to 8 Dawn in a year, that's really fast. I've seen them play games, just playing games and like looking over it for like eight to 10 hours a day for the entire year. And that's how many games is that? Let's see. Let's let's take let's take an average of like, well, they're not. No, they're not playing Blitz. They're just playing like 10 minute games because blitzing doesn't make you improve. You have to be able to think and read at least a little bit. But what they're doing is gaining experience really rapidly. So let's say we even take eight games a day and then we times that by seven days in the week times 52 uh, weeks in a year. I think that's right. Uh, I just just do what is it? 365 eight times 365. That's yeah, almost 3000 games in a year. So let's assume they take a couple days off. You're probably looking at maybe about 2500 games a year. So if you want to say I want to get to dawn as fast as I can, I can pull up any one of your profiles. And the, assuming you're not playing Extreme Blitz, uh, I can probably pull, pull up any one of your profiles, and I don't think you have 2,500 games. Let's look at, uh, what is it, Illuck? <laughs> What's your, yeah. How many games do you have? 2,655. <laughs> but granted, uh, I think... I, 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 yeah, I want to say that uh, I have... I've barely played in the past like i want to say eight, seven or eight years but um but i also have way more than those because i play a lot on kgs as well yeah so, I'm so in the order of like four to five thousand yeah yeah so you're you're four on right now you've said you just said you played about four to five thousand games when i w uh in my go history i've probably played maybe five to seven thousand games somewhere around there um it, it, i would have to count uh, all on the KGS archives, and then I have to count all my tournaments. Then I have to count OGS, and but probably in the thousands because I also played uh, like two Go games, two to three Go games a week for like every weekend at Go Club for five years to ten years, uh, plus all the ranked games I played on KGS. So yeah, thousands, thousands of games, guys. So I want you to think about 
how many games do you put in a week? How many games do you have now? If you're at like two or three hundred and you're putting in like three or four games a week, how long will it take you to get to 2,500 games or to 5,000 games? And I want you to I want you to think about that when you're thinking about efficiency. That's that's one of the biggest things that my students, um, unfortunately, and most people, it's not their fault. It's because Westerners don't have a lot of time. But I really want you to think about that when you're thinking about why am I not improving as fast as I could be? Or why is other people improving faster than me? It doesn't mean you're bad. It just means probably you're not getting enough experience fast enough. But efficiency is important too. I do 3,000 minimum a year. You do 3,000 a year? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but how how many lessons have you had and uh, how many Go problems do you, you know, do? I don't do the Go problems like you said. You've, you've been directing me to on some of that to get me on track. Right. So I appreciate that. And, um, but I... I will say, though... Um, but this is true for Buzzsaw as well. The older you are, the, the harder it is. It's not It's not like it's impossible to get to Dawn, but probably you will have to work twice as hard as a young person. Just simply, oh, be yeah. just simply because no Go is for some reason ageist and also sexist. <laughs> I don't know why. It, so I am doubly disabled? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's actually sexist at the pro levels, not at the amateur levels. Because there's, oh. there's plenty of female strong Dawn players. But for some reason, it's kind of hard to believe in a way. But oh no, for, I have no idea why. I have no idea why. But just look at the go players, top ranked players. How far down do you have to go to find a female? Like I, I have no idea why. And it's not that females aren't studying, and they're freaking strong. Uh, let's look at female. Uh, number seventy-five. That's really freaking good. Under a hundred is really good. One sixty-nine. 187 yeah and then 203 so in the top 300 in the top 200 players there's only three females okay i don't know why okay and you got rui naiwe and choyan uh wherever she is yeah right here yeah she's 309 oh no, no. i thought she was higher than that those no, two guys the first yeah they're freaking strong like i've I've listened to them give lectures and game reviews. They're freaking strong, okay? I cannot tell you how strong they are. But even then, they're not even the top 10, or the barely, there's one in the top 100 players. So don't I don't know why. I'm not like a psychologist. I'm not a biologist or anything like that. I have no idea why. But go is sexist. <laughs> it just is. The, the Reina Wei, I think, at her prime was probably top 10 or 15. Rui Nai was amazing. If you guys yeah, want... If you want to hear uh, some really cool Go history, Rui Nai Wei has an amazing story. Like, she's stupid strong. And I think uh, I heard some stories from Choyan about how they actually prevented Rui Nai Wei from entering some of the uh women's tournaments because they said she's too strong she'll just win and take money out of our country and so there's like actual politics involved preventing her because she was just so strong so she has some really cool stories i also heard from choi on how she like both respected and really hated rui Nawe because she worked so hard to beat her and she kept losing a lot and then she finally did beat her like once but her win-loss ratio was like really bad um, and so she like really hates playing Rui and Iway, but also really wants to play her to beat her. She she wants to beat her so bad. Um, and they had she really um, wanted to beat Rui and Iway because Rui and Iway is just so freaking strong, or she was anyway. I think now she's uh, falling down, but her story is really cool. So if you want a really cool story, um, read up on her story. She had some really cool stuff, and she actually was one of the only females, or one of the uh, definitely the I think the first female to compete and actually hold her own in a decent way in international tournaments so she uh kind of she's like the leading uh female go player for many many years really cool really cool story all right um we yeah, are she, sorry i was saying, no, uh, just to mention that she was uh, i think she's the only female that reached top four in an international tournament yeah she's oh, crazy good is really cool I, i'm a huge fan I, of her in a way 
Yeah, she she also beat Li Changhao um, and got a actual like full ter- open tournament title in Korea, which is mm. insane. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, but yeah, so we'll go ahead and leave it at that. Uh, I think. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of cool Go history. So the more like you learn, there's there's so many things um, that out there that you can learn. Uh, but. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, we talked a lot about about the stuff today, so hopefully you guys did find the class educational and maybe entertaining because of the history and stuff. Um, but yeah, so study hard, work hard, and next month we are going to start uh, trying to talk about how we choose Josekis. Um, I'm, I think we got some double digit cues in here now, and I would like to focus on the double digit cues a little bit more than single digit cues, but. I will also talk about the single digit Q stuff as well. And I think it'll also be good to understand fundamentally how to choose Josekis and how to how do they lead to openings and stuff. Um, and then how Josekis work in openings. And we'll probably start with like some double digit Q introductions and then probably be in the single digit Q range by the end of the month. Um, so yeah, hopefully you guys are looking for, will look forward to that. And as always, thank you for showing up. Without you guys being here, the class would be a little bit boring and I would just be lecturing. So it's uh, a lot of fun to bounce things off of you guys. So thanks for being here. Um, Yeah, so hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, here's to another month. And I will see you guys when I see you. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, Yeah. thanks for the class. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good one. Right. Bye-bye.